Well, this is fun. This is so great to be up here and to, to come and have this opportunity. Thank you very much for the privilege of being here. Thank you for, uh, we got to the hotel and there's actually a beautiful um, fruit, well, you know, it's one of those edible arrangements. I don't say fruit basket, but this is actually cut in beautiful flowers and stuff like that. And um, I don't normally eat healthy, but I ate, that, I ate some of that, which was nice. And uh, I, had no, like, I don't know anything about New Jersey, I have to be honest with you. We were here in New York several years ago with the kids. We just went to like the Cake Boss Bakery. Uh, that was about as much time as we spent in New Jersey. I don't know. It'd be fun to be here because like Chicago has a reputation that's not great, right? <laughs> like if you've never been to Chicago, you probably don't want to come to Chicago. It's actually better than it sounds. And I don't know about like New Jersey. I was, like if you would have said, hey, we, we have some gift for you. Uh, you're going to pick it up at the front desk. I wouldn't have thought like edible arrangement. I would have thought maybe a couple packs of cigarettes or something like that, <laughs> you know? So it's my last New Jersey joke. Sorry about that. All right, we got to move because we're going we're gonna to finish close to on time. And um, I feel very, very inadequate to actually be, be uh, your uh, retreat speaker. And you'll see why in a moment. Um, but I know that there is a lot that the Lord has for us in his word, right? And uh, I don't expect you to remember uh, even 10% of what I say. My hope and prayer is that there's, there's maybe one thing you can walk away with as, as a couple and say, this is how the Lord spoke to us, uh, uh, maybe each session or this weekend, and this is what we're going to do with it. Because uh, there's just, uh, God is so good, isn't he? He is so good, he's so kind to us. And so um, I want to begin with something that wasn't my idea. It was actually recommended to me, and I'm hoping that it's actually helpful for us tonight. Um, so I need, you, I need to ask you for five seconds of courage. And then if you want to go back to being cowards, if that's your thing, you go right ahead. But here's the, here's the thing I need. So many of us, if not most, possibly all of us, are going through a difficult time right now for one reason or another. If I were to ask you, is there a, um, a pain point in your life right now? It, it could be that there's a health issue, uh, you or your spouse hate their job, maybe you don't like each other very much, or there's a financial pressure in your life right now, there are issues with your kids or with your friends or parents or something like that. Um, I want to ask you to raise your hand. If that describes you, any one of those things, you have a pain point in your life right now, would you just raise your hand? All right, most of you, and then the rest of you, you have to work on telling the truth in this church, apparently. <laughs> so I don't know if you got a chance to look around, but here, here's the reason why I bring that up, is that I think it's so important for all of us to know, in the Christian life, but also in marriage, that you are not alone, right? It's so easy just to think everybody else is doing better than we are, because we can put on a really good show. It's important, I think, to know that you're not alone because uh, we have to be real in the church, right? I mean, I am so blessed by talking to older, parent, older parents who would say, it's only the grace of God that my kids turned out, you know, like they're not in prison right now or something, right? They're just, they're happy with the way their kids turned out. I've never heard an older godly parent take credit for it, not one. Every one of them just points to the grace of God. So the church is the place where we can be real. And so my hope and prayer is that is that for you in this place, and I'm sure that it's, it's likely true, but even this weekend, you guys can be real. Uh, next is that we need each other, right? The very people that the Lord might use to help you in your marriage could be in this room right now or certainly in this church. And so I think we, it'd be so helpful for us to see ourselves in that role, encouraging one another. Um, third, you've undoubtedly heard that pain is a great teacher, and I think it is, because it brings us to the end of ourselves, right? We... we We've exhausted all of the resources except for the love and the grace of God. When we come to a place where we realize, I'm not only in pain, there's nothing I can do about it. All we can do is, is go to the Lord. And that's exactly where growth really happens. And then finally, be encouraged. I think the Lord has given us everything that we need to persevere in this life and to, and to be spiritually successful. I, I go back to the fact that God's presence and his promises are more than sufficient. We don't really need a lot more than that. So let me dive in. I remember uh, pretty well the very first marriage conference that Carme and I ever attended as newlyweds. It was with uh, Gary Chapman, the author, author of the Five Love Languages. Probably all know him. And at the end of the last session, Carme turned to me and she said, uh, was there anything new you learned at this conference? And I made, uh, uh, I made a choice. I chose to be honest. And I said, no. And that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Uh, Carme then took the program and hit me over the head with it and asked me, 
then why aren't you doing any of it? Yeah. So I bring up that story because some of you may be wondering, well, what are your qualifications to, to teach this conference? And I hope that that puts any doubts to bed. <laughs> All right, we've got to move along. So as I was preparing these talks, I was really tempted to come up with some titles that really uh, amazed you. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at your, your uh, uh, handout now. But I wanted to amaze you with some intellectual sounding titles. I've gone to seminary so many times I've lost count. Um, but I was getting really confused in the process. And so I decided, you know what? What is it that I've learned from 25 years of marriage, about 45, 46 years of being a Christian, and 27 years of being a pastor? And I came up with the following three titles. Don't be arrogant, don't be selfish, and be like Jesus. That's it. That's all I got. Now, don't be stupid was nixed by the wife. Uh, which was disappointing because it was not only my favorite, it was also, also the most frequent advice I'd gotten over the course of my life. So here's what I want you to do real quickly. Turn to your spouse and tell them which one of the three you think you, not they, you need to hear the most this weekend. All right, good. We'll see if you're right at the end. Now, some of you may have heard those and think, okay, don't be arrogant, don't be selfish, be like Jesus. Don't be arrogant... All right, if you don't stop talking, I'm going to have you put your heads on your desks. I'm going to call parents in. And so um, you're thinking to yourself, you know, arrogant and selfish are pretty close, right? And, and they really are close. In fact, if you're good at multitasking, there's no reason why you can't be arrogant and selfish at the same time without a lot of effort. Um, to be clear, I'm not recommending that. But while arrogance and selfishness go hand in hand, uh, I want to make a distinction for us this weekend and saying that arrogance is kind of how you view yourself and your, your husband or wife, and selfishness is how you treat them. That's the distinction we're going to be making here. Uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So basically, the three titles are this. Don't view yourself as better or having more to offer in your marriage than your spouse. Another way of saying that I'd like is don't underestimate what God can do through your spouse. And I think we can do that. Number two, don't put your desires or needs before your spouse's desires and needs. In fact, try to outdo them in love. And then third, treat your husband or your wife the way Jesus treats you, which you really can't do, but I would say at least try, right? Do the best you can. Now, these are simple. And the reason why I wanted to keep them simple is because what I have found in, in all these years as a pastor and as a married man is that simple most often is all you need. Have you ever heard that phrase, uh, marriage isn't rocket surgery. Yeah, think about it if you don't, yeah. Uh, it's a mix of a couple of metaphors, I think. Marriage isn't rocket surgery. Now, I remember a seminary professor telling me, or telling our class, that the Christian life does not get any more complicated than trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And that was not a Sunday school class, that was a seminary class that I paid good money for. And now 30 years later, I would say I absolutely agree. It doesn't really get any more complicated than that. The Christian life, I would say, is not easy, but it's not complicated. We, we complicate it, but God hasn't complicated it. It's, it's not easy. It is difficult because we are sinful people living in a broken and sinful world, but it is not complicated. So think about this with me. I, I would say if you get the basics down, you will likely do very well in your Christian life, but in your marriage. The reason why many marriages lack, lack genuine intimacy, and I'm using that term in the, in the broadest sense, right? Closeness on every level. It's not because it's too complicated to attain. You don't have to be intelligent to be thoughtful and humble. You don't have to be a genius to be loving and kind. You don't have to be especially clever to be generous and gracious. You don't need to be all that smart to commit yourself to understanding your spouse. But one of the main reasons why marriages lack in intimacy is that we act arrogantly and selfishly far too often, and we act like Jesus far too rarely. But imagine for a minute, imagine what your marriage would be like if you actually did do the best you can with God's help to be humble towards your spouse and to put their needs and their desires ahead of your own and to strive to love them the way Jesus loves you. Just imagine the kind of marriage that you would have. You might feel like at this point in your marriage, like, I don't think that's ever going to happen. You know, you might just feel so discouraged. There's probably in this room people at every, every stage of marriage, newlyweds, people have been married for a long time. 
but also in terms of the level of intimacy that you feel, the level of closeness that you feel, how excited you are to go home at the end of the day, how excited you are to see one another. Some of you are in a place right now, I suspect, that it's, it's, it's at a pretty low level. But the great news is, and, and I, I want to make sure that you really understand this, right? especially if you're in that place, it's, it's hard to see getting past that. But no marriage is beyond the help of the Lord when we ask him for it. Right? And this is the very thing he's in the business of doing, is making his people more like Jesus. And think about 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so sins like arrogance and selfishness, they're being put to death by the Holy Spirit so that we are increasingly more like Jesus. And the more you and your spouse are like Jesus, the better your marriage will be. Carmen and I have definitely seen that over 25 years of marriage. It took me a little longer to get there than her, but we, we're getting there, right? All right, now, before I dive into how sickeningly arrogant all of you are, I need to lay out three indispensable truths. Now, I, I, the reason I, I want to say this, and I'll say them, I'll say them quickly, but I can, I can make sure you get all the notes. Um, what I don't want you to walk away with today is just things that you'd say, well, that was good advice, you know, or that one thing here was helpful. Um, I think if, I, if, if that's what you walk away with, I, I don't think I have done what God's called me to do. These three truths actually help us to have a bigger picture, a bigger um, understanding, a foundation of what's going on. And then none of these you don't know, but I, I think they're important for me to, to make sure I ex- make explicit. Number one, God's word is relevant. It is relevant to your marriage. It is eternally true. It is grounded in God's character. And so I hope the stories that I tell from our experience and others are helpful, um, but it's the word of God that makes a difference. And the most powerful illustration I could give you is a couple um, that's shared in the singles group, not at Moody Church, but a church that I was at before, where there had been literally years of infidelity on the part of the husband. And they came and they shared how they were reconciled. And what it was actually the wife who said this, She said, what brought us back together was studying the book of Proverbs together. So that was the number one thing she said that reconciled their marriage. The word of God is powerful. Number two, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to apply the word of God, right? We can't do that on our own. I I love Galatians 5.16, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's, 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 again, it's not easy. It's simple. It's not complicated. He is our helper. Third, your desire for a great marriage It has to be grounded in something deeper, something richer than I I just want to have a great companion. We want to have a lot of fun together, you know? Um, Those are good things, but they're not enough to weather the storms that that you will face as a couple. Uh, My pastor for many years, Erwin Lutzer, uh, he had a a great definition of marriage. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Is it kind of going in and out? Sorry. Whenever I started wearing these, I started feeling like our, our tech crew said, okay, you need to wear that. I'm like, I just feel like Britney Spears wearing that. <laughs> and then you're like, why didn't you go with a male pop star? And I'm like, just put it on. We'll move on. He had a great definition for marriage. He actually said this at a wedding we attended. He said, marriage is two people coming together to solve problems that they would not have if they remained single. <laughs> <clears throat> There's some truth in that, but big picture is right, and you know this, Ephesians 5. This beautiful picture of husbands and wives uh, living out this, this drama of Jesus uh, and his bride, the church. We'll talk more about that in our third session, but I, I think it's so important. These three things are critical to the success of your marriage, right? You read the word of God regularly. You're taking that in individually as a couple. You're relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, um, and you have a God-designed view for your marriage. It's gonna, together, those things give you the direction, the power, and the motivation. The direction, the power, and the motivation to have a great marriage. So, all right, let's dive in. I want to read a couple of verses for you here, short verses, and then they, I would, what I would say is probably one of the most significant verses for us on, on uh, arrogance. Proverbs twelve fifteen: the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 22, 4, humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Proverbs 27, 2, this is good. Some of us, myself included, we, we need to hear this more often, right? Let someone else praise you. Implication, it shouldn't be you all the time. Um, And not your own mouth. An outsider and not your own lips. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And of course, Philippians 2, uh, 3 through 8, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. 
Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And this, if there was one verse, of course, for this, this lesson, this would be it. Have that same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I mean, there's just a, a lowering each time, a greater example of humility that, that Jesus went through. It is remarkable. So my one, my one word of pastoral counsel to you in this first session is don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. You can define arrogance a lot of different ways. Um, somebody recently told me uh, um, an arrogant person is always confident, occasionally right. Ever heard that before? They're always confident, occasionally right. And the key there is confidence, right? For some people, it hasn't seemed to dawn on them that not only could they be wrong, but they've actually been wrong many times. And that their spouse or another person actually has insights that they need to hear. It's the attitude that's the problem, right? Fundamentally, it's an attitude of marriage that says to your spouse, I don't think you have nearly as much to offer as I do. Instead of thanking your spouse when they're right and you're wrong, your pride is hurt and it bothers you. So that's, I mean, I think we all know what arrogance is. So that's, that's kind of arrogance in a nutshell. It's, be, it's basically believing that in your marriage, you're always the teacher and never the student. You are the dispenser of wisdom and knowledge, not the recipient of it. You might not say it out loud, and then again you might, but you believe that your spouse is one lucky person to be married to you. <laughs> I'm not going to ask how many of you actually have said that to your spouse because I'd have to raise my hand. <laughs> Arrogance shows up in a variety of ways in marriage, right? I think decision-making is one of the ways. If you believe you're wiser and more insightful than your spouse, then you are far less likely to seek their input or to, to really weigh it carefully. Arrogance also shows up in conflict resolution, right? This is, this is fun. It's more commonly known as fighting. I recall listening to a study or reading a study that talked about predictors of, uh, of divorce and marriage. And the surprising discovery was it, it actually is less important how often you argue or fight. It's more the nature of how you argue and fight. So you could fight less often, but if you fight and attack each other, then you're more likely to wind up either in a very miserable marriage or in a divorce. A few years into our marriage, longer than it should have been, I realized that I was acting arrogantly in some areas, especially when we would argue. And uh, it showed up in a couple of ways. Sometimes in the middle of an argument, and I can remember one argument, I don't remember what it was about. Um, I think we, we, were, we were in a particular part of the house that I remember. I think we were like in the basement or something. And, and Carme would, would say something, because she has a better memory than I do, and she would say something that would make me realize in the middle of the argument that I was wrong. Like, I, I had no footing for what we were arguing now. And I'd be like, oh my goodness, I'm totally wrong. I need to apologize. And then another thought would come into my head. She doesn't know I know I'm wrong. <laughs> Why give up now? You could still sneak a win out of this. I, d I did that. I'm trying to make it sound funny because I want you to like me. But uh, not good. Not good, Pastor. So eventually, by God's grace, I did learn to admit in the middle of an argument when I was wrong, and it, and it shocked Carme when I would do that. So here's an idea, pro tip, when arguing with your spouse, if you can't stop and pray, the next best thing, shut up. Don't talk, walk away, say, I need some time. Because you're only going to make it worse, right? If you keep talking and you're not in a spirit where you could just say, listen, this isn't, this isn't working out, I gotta, we got to stop and pray, then, then stop talking. I remember one time, real quickly, Carme and I were, were arguing. We were sitting on different couches across from each other in the living room. And she said to me, uh, she said, I don't want to fight about this. She goes, why are, you, why are you sitting over there? Why aren't you sitting next to me? And I'm like, because we're fighting. Like, this is how you do it. I said, after we fight, I come sit next to you. Right? It's coming, but let's fight for a little while here, you know? One of the least... ain't. Oh, I've got to be careful here. I got I, all my relatives on my wife's side are Italian. One of the calmest Italians I've ever met is my wife. I mean, she just doesn't fight. One time we, I was arguing with her about something, and she finally came back and started arguing. And I literally said to her, that's all I'm asking for, a little bit of give and take. It's good. <laughs> all right. So um, one of the times we were arguing about something, I really clearly remember this one. We were actually, uh, um, 
It was in the morning sometime, and we'd already gotten out of bed, and we were talking, and there was something that Carme had done. I don't remember what it was. It was probably pretty evil, I got to tell you. I mean, she's, she looks beautiful, and she is, but she's Italian, so it was probably evil. And I remember going to Carme, and I, I was confident that I was on the side of the angels. I could almost hear them singing when I was going to Carme to let her know what she had done wrong. And, and I just, I laid all of the blame on her shoulders for whatever it was that, it, that, that had happened. I never raised my voice. I didn't use any bad words. I just basically said, this whole problem is your fault. Fix it. And then I walked away triumphantly until the Holy Spirit said, basically, don't ever talk to your wife that way again. That was arrogant. That was self-righteous. Don't do that. Another way I've been arrogant, this is the last confession you're getting out of me, is uh, I didn't value Carme's perspective. And so I hesitate to say this, but I think maybe it, maybe it would be helpful if, if, if I kind of give a little bit of our story, right? So I was raised in a Christian family, came to the Lord about age nine. Um, Carme came to know the Lord in her, in her early mid-20s, like about 24. When I, when I met her at church, she'd only been a believer for uh, five months. So I was like, kind of like, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to like her, though I did. And Daryl Worley, uh, who was my pastor, my executive pastor, when I asked him about it, he said, well, just take it slow. And so we, we kind of did, actually. Um, so I went, to, um, I went to Christian school uh, from high school on. I went to Bible college. I went to seminary a couple times by the time we had met. Um, and Carme's family, you know, it was a, a sort of a traditional Italian household. You're going to get married. You're going to have babies. You don't need to go to college. Um, and she wasn't saved. She was you know, kind of spiritually minded, but didn't know the Lord. And so there were times when I, you know, we just didn't, we, I might have thought, what is a newer believer who, uh, I, I'm not saying I had great grades in Greek and Hebrew, but she never had Greek and Hebrew. Never had Greek and Hebrew. I'm like, how are we going to make this work, right? <laughs> So like early on, I learned, I could just say, she's like, well, that, that doesn't sound right. I would say, sweetheart, it's, the word is hachash. It's in the Hebrew. It's in Zechariah. And, and if you understood Hebrew, you'd know why I'm right and, and you're wrong. And um, it never worked. It never worked. But I'll tell you real quickly, uh, the Lord gave me insight into Carme's discernment early in our marriage. Her spiritual discernment was one of the things that attracted me most. And then we got into a very short-lived um, conflict with close friends. They misunderstood something that we had done, really I had done, and it was all well-intentioned, other things kind of happened, and the conflict, it really kind of, it spoiled our friendship for a couple years. And I remember when it was over, uh, that Carme had said, she, she didn't say, oh, I told you so, but I remember that she said, I would walk carefully, I would walk carefully on this. And I'm like, I, I think I am, I don't think it's a big deal, and it, and it blew up. And after that, and that was early, that was 20 years ago, right? After that, I, if we ever disagree, by the grace of God, I go to her, I go, help me understand exactly what you're thinking. I really want to know. I know you're not going to be able to go into the Hebrew, that's fine, but tell me what it is you're thinking because I want to know what I'm missing. Okay, I said last confession. All right, why is arrogance so destructive to intimacy and marriage? Um, these are easy. I guess I'll give you the notes. I just want you to kind of soak this in. One, you become very difficult to live with. Nobody likes know-it-alls. I don't care how cute you are. Nobody likes to know it all. Nobody wants to listen to stories where you're always the hero. Uh, nobody wants to cuddle with someone who's more attracted to themselves than to you. Arrogance is extremely unattractive. It repels intimacy, right? Uh, Proverbs 21.9, I think it applies both to men and women. It is better to live in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome, let's say, person. And a quarrelsome person's quarrelsome because they always think they know right. So my question is, is that you? Are you a quarrelsome spouse? Number two, marriage will never rise higher than where the know-it-all can take it by themselves, right? You're, you're, you're not bringing your partner in with all their strengths and their gifts. You're just saying, I don't really value what you bring. And so, uh, I, you know, we have a lot of snow in Chicago. And so it's kind of like saying, you know what, if intimacy was like shoveling your driveway, it's like insisting that you only use your shovel because it's better, right? It's, it's, it's a lot more work. You're not going to get where you want to go. And then finally, I think maybe most, most powerfully is that Arrogance belittles and humiliates your spouse. You've all probably been victims of people you've talked to that are arrogant, right? Like, I mean, the people that, that make me feel the worst are, are the know-it-all Christians that, that will you know, maybe talk to me at church or something like that, and they know everything about 
you know, when the Lord is going to return and what the Antichrist is going to look like, the shoes he's going to wear. And I'm like, you know, and I got, they're reading all these books and they keep saying, well, well, pastor, have you read this? Have you read this? Have you read this? And then like the third or fourth time I go, no, listen, I'm, I like to read, but I haven't read any of the books that you've read, you know, but they make you feel like you're an idiot. And I'm like, I went to seminary, I've got degrees, you know. So it makes you, it makes you, it belittles and humiliates your spouse. You're treating them like a child rather than a co-heir of the grace of God. It tears them down rather than builds them up, right? What does Ephesians 4.29 say? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. I love that. As fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. It's beautiful. How can arrogance in marriage be overcome? That's hopefully, (laughs) we need to walk away with that. Number one, by looking to Jesus. Right? That's it. Hebrews 12, 2, one of my favorite verses. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Right? So he saw the joy ahead, and that empowered him to endure the cross, despised the shame. Didn't give in to it. He despised the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Whenever you're wondering, how should I treat my husband? How should I treat my wife? You know, we look to Jesus. Look at his example. And if you tend toward arrogance, how can you possibly be arrogant when you're, when you're looking at yourself in, in light of Jesus? You can't. It's, it's, you'd be completely blind. Number two, really important, owning, and, uh, owning your shortcomings and failures. Romans 12.3 says, essentially, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought, but to think with sober judgment. I, I, I have discovered this over the years. I am so thankful for this. There is great freedom in having a sober view of yourself. There is great freedom in not having to defend yourself all the time, not feeling like you have to be right, not feeling like you um, have to be you know, uh, smarter than the person you're talking to. I mean, you don't have to feel um, inadequate. You can learn from people, from anybody at any time. I mean, I, I just love that. You know, Jesus tells a, a very simple uh, story in Luke 14 about, so if you're invited to a feast or a wedding, don't take the seat of honor and then you know, the host comes and says, yeah, that's not really for you. Why don't you go sit down at the end and you're humbled in front of everybody. He said, take the seat, the low seat, and let the host kind of exalt you in front of everyone. And that applies, obviously, in all kinds of situations. What I have found is that there, there was a, uh, we were having a conversation uh, among staff, and somehow it came to criticisms, criticisms of my preaching. And uh, I can't get into why, but because um, I'll start crying. But, but we were talking about criticisms of my preaching, and it, it didn't bother me. I was kind of listening. And one of the pastors actually said to me, he goes, why aren't you crying right now? And I'm like, I'm like, well, maybe I don't understand the extent of their criticisms. But I'm like, everybody's preaching gets criticized, other than Pastor Randy, probably. I mean, they criticize Chuck Swindoll. They criticize John MacArthur. They criticize, you know, Erwin Lutzer, people that are writing books on this stuff. Like, why would I be an exception to that, Right? So having a sober view of yourself is like, listen, I know that as an executive pastor, there are certain things I'm pretty good at, and I know there are things I'm not good at at all. And I'll tell you, the freedom of just having staff that are better at that, and I can just say, uh, Tim, can you handle that? Because I, I sent our worship pastor an email. I said, Tim, would you handle this situation? I have no idea what to do. And he wrote an email, and I wrote back, I goes, that was just beautiful, right? Um, okay, number three, seeking to truly understand your spouse. Really critical. I know that Pastor Randy's going through, you guys are going through 1 Peter right now, and you've been in 1 Peter 3 recently, so that's not new. I, I love that. You have to understand, really seek to understand uh, your husband or wife. It's, it's obviously in verse 7 there, it's talking to the husbands. Uh, I don't think the wives are completely off the hook and trying to figure out what is this guy thinking. It will only help you if you figure it out. Um, but you've got to just ask questions of each other to try to understand why do you think that way, even if you disagree. Humbly ask questions. One time I asked Carmen a question, she was in the kitchen, and I just said, hey, babe, why are you doing it that way? And I must have had a, you know, one of Carmen's superpowers is detecting inappropriate tones in my voice. And, uh, and so she replied, this is a true story, she replied, don't you really mean to ask, why are you doing it that way, you idiot? And I was like, I withdraw the question. So, fourth and finally, by treating your spouse with a recognition that he or she is a gift from God and is designed to make you more like Christ. You married a person, not a compilation of, of strengths and weaknesses, right? This is a person. 
And here's the thing that I, 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 I've learned, right? Nobody has eyes in the back of their head. I don't see the world from all 360 degrees. I have a very narrow slice of the pie that I can see it from. My background, my personality, my experience, and so forth. When I got married, I understood that, that Carme, with all of her experience and wisdom, and even just being a woman, she opened my eyes to things I simply would never have seen, right? I need her. You need one another to see the world the way it is. And our, our tendency sometimes is to say, well, that's a different way of looking at it. Therefore, it's stupid and wrong, right? That's our pride. We need to humble ourselves and say, no, there's actually something there I need to learn. Carme and I are very, very different people. We actually teach a premarital class on why you're different. And uh, I, I touched on a little bit about that. But we, what we have discovered, and I, I, I'll say it because I'm up here. Um, I, what I thought I needed in, in, a, in a wife, Carme is not really what I thought I needed. I thought I needed a woman who'd been saved when she was much younger, I thought she needed to come from a Christian family, and I thought when, we, when I met her, she'd be wearing a flowered dress, because that's what Christian women wear. And none of the above. She wore a leather biker jacket. She wasn't saved until recently. Her parents, uh, the family doesn't know the Lord, and she's exactly what I needed, exactly. Um, so in short, look to Jesus, lower your, lower your view of yourself, exalt your view of your spouse, acknowledge God's wisdom in giving you the spouse that you have. All of these things are consistent with what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, right? All right, let me pray. Father, this is a lot. And I, uh, I just pray, Father, that for each one of us, uh, me and Carme included, I pray that you would help us to, to, to grab hold of whatever it is that you want us to do uh, from this day forward in really mm -hmm. exalting our view of our spouse. You have given to us uh, the husband or the wife that we have. Regardless of the, of the circumstances, Lord, we are married. We're husband and wife. And they have gifts and talents and insight and wisdom, discernment that we lack. And I pray, Father, that you would humble us if we won't humble ourselves, that we would view them the way that we should, that we would honor them, and that we would look to Jesus for all these things, that we would, we would truly treasure the gift that you've given to us in our spouse, Lord. That's what we are called to do, and that's what we ask that you would empower us to do wherever we're falling short. But we want to love you and, and thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you, Father, for the spouse that you've given to us. Help us to be faithful, to love them as you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.